Hello, so today we're going to read chapter 36 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Tuesday, December 3rd to Friday, December 13th, 1776. Lady Seymour was stuck by, struck by a fever whilst visiting up in Greenwich. She had to be carried to her chamber, her skin the color of old beeswax candle. Dr. Dastang came to bleed her so that her bodily humors could go back into balance. When the bleeding was over, Madame saw the doctor to the door. I was dusting the grandfather clock in the front hall. Good sir, Madame said in a low voice. I wonder, I believe our aunt would recover faster at our estate in Charleston. She could sit in the sun for hours and breathe the healthful air. Don't you agree? The doctor's bushy eyebrows flew up in alarm. South Carolina is a hundred miles from here. Over bad roads, Lady Seymour would be dead by Philadelphia which was likely Madame's intention, I thought. The doctor pulled up his gloves and picked up his bag. I doubt she'll be well enough to travel until spring. I will call again tomorrow. He tipped his hat. Good day, Madame. Lady Seymour's bell rang upstairs as the door closed behind him. Madame squeezed her lips tight together. I thought she had bit them off. Girl, she spat, go see what she wants. So you can see, <laughs> she's still trying to get rid of her aunt, isn't she? By supper, it had been decided that I would tend Lady Seymour whilst she was bedridden. The master uses connections to the British High Command to secure extra firewood for the house, declaring that his aunt's bedchamber should be kept warm as the month of June. The heat of the room helped to bake out the fever in Lady Seymour's blood and ease her cough. It was warm enough that I could go about in stocking feet, which was a comfort for my shoes had taken to pinching my toes something wicked. As she recovered, the lady took to reading all of the newspapers printed in the city. Whenever she dropped off to sleep, I would steal as many sentences as I could. Thusly, I followed the progress of the war, what was left of it. The flame of independence was sputtering and expected to burn out any day. The rebels had run out of ammunition, soldiers, and money. Mayor Matthews, who had plotted to kill General Washington, escaped from the rebel prison and returned to New York in triumph. The American Congress, frightened by the marching British, fled Philadelphia and ran to Baltimore. Newport, in my home state of Rhode Island, fell to the British also. When I read that last bit of news, I was stunned. I had spared a thought for Rhode Island in months. Twas several days before I could again sneak up to the Bridewell, toting sausages, crusts, and cheese rinds. The guard stole a few of the sausages and gave me only a few moments to conversate. It mattered not. Curzon was not feeling up to much talk. I sat on the stone floor and checked the hole in his leg. It was hot, but free of yellow pus. Conditions in the prison had eased some. Folks in town had donated enough blankets that there was one to be shared between every two or three men. The British promised each prisoner would receive two pounds of pork and a hard stack biscuit every week. They did not announce that the pork was often spoiled, nor that the men had to eat it raw, for there was no fire for them to cook over. For my next visit, I saved my own helping of mince pie. I filled the bucket with potato scraps and mutton fat and put the pie on top. The, the guard took the pie, as I'd hoped. I love a good mince pie, he said as he unlocked the door to the prison, pie crumbs spilling from his mouth. Frozen bodies were stacked in the hall waiting to be buried in the pits. The clothes had been taken from their bodies to keep the living soldiers warm. I kept my eyes to the ground out of modesty. Curzon was still not in the mood for conversating, not even a little bit. I thought he looked feverish, but when I went to feel his forehead, he pushed my hand away. The men snickered at that. I took my empty bucket and left. Snow fell that night. Lady Seymour prepared an errand list for me the next afternoon. She had spent the morning gazing into the fire and had not taken any food. I made bold and suggested that she eat a biscuit with honey for her own good. You need strength to get through the winter, I added. She set down her pen, picked up her teacup, and sipped the hot cinnamon water. I thought it pleased you when I left so much on my plate. Ma'am, the more I leave behind, the more there is for you to take to the prison. She studied me close. I thought she could see my thoughts. That is where you're taking the table scraps, isn't it? My head bobbed once, like a puppet's. Am I to assume you know someone confined there? I found my voice. Yes, ma'am. She sipped again and looked at me over the rim of her teacup. It is honorable to, honorable to help a friend in need. How did you know? I blurted out. She folded the sheet of paper on the table. These are the items I would like you to fetch for me. Purchase the ink and newspapers at Rivington's, but not the books. He overcharges. 
Go to that shop near the baker on Hanover Square. Elihu said they haven't closed. I bobbed once and took the paper. Please, ma'am, I tried again. How did you know? Her gaze returned to the logs in the hearth. Take care how you go, Isabel. Many people think it is fine and Christian thing to help the prisoners, but I do not think my niece is one of them. Yes, ma'am, I whispered. It started to snow whilst I was in Rivington. The wind blew the snow direct into my face as I crossed the square, and I was grateful to step into the shelter of the stationer's store, for it was warm and dry inside, near peaceful. It was such a word that you could describe the shop. A jelly-bellied officer with thick spectacles was purchasing a full stack of books from the man behind the counter. They were deep in their talk and appeared not to notice me. I took a slow turn around the shop, admiring the shelves heavy with books, business forms, proclamations from Parliament and General Howe, slates, thick paper, quills, and sealing wax. The books called to me. My fingers itched to touch them. It had been so many months since I dug the story of Robinson Crusoe. I glanced toward the counter, and the men were arguing friendly-like with a fellow named Hume. They both had their faces planted in the same pamphlet. When I trod on a squeaky board, they didn't even look up. I reached up to a bookshelf and flipped my way through the bookstands standing at detention. The titles were near as long as the books themselves. Treaties of the Propagation of Sheep, The Manufacturers of Wool and the Cultivation of man and Manufacture of Flax by John Wiley. Or Cato Major or His Discourse of Old Age with Explanatory Notes by M. T. Cicero. Or Poems on the Various Subjects Religious and Moral by Phillips Wheatley. Philip, Phyllis Wheatley and countless tracts containing sermon and advice. My fingers backed up. Mama told me about Miss Wheatley. She was kidnapped in Africa, sold in Boston, and wrote fancy poetry that smart people liked. She had visited London and England. She had been enslaved as a girl and was now a free woman. I took the slim book off the shelf and opened the cover. I had never read a poem before. What if I lacked the skill? What if I were caught? Might as well throw myself in the river. Bang! The door closing startled me, so I near dropped the volume. I quickly set it back on the shelf and approached the counter. Can I help you? asked the young man who stood behind it. Yes, please, sir. I handed in the list. From the Lady Seymour. I hear she's been poorly, he said as he looked over the list. Yes, sir, but she's strong enough to sit by the fire now, and she has a powerful urge to read. He nodded. She's a good customer. I'm glad she's on the mend. He quickly assembled everything on the list, the letters of Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, History of the Roman Republic, Volume 1, and the Expedition of Humpty Clinker, and pulled out a large sheet of paper to wrap them in. As he worked the scissors, he paused. You knew that boy, didn't you? Pardon me? He continued cutting. Bellingham's boy, the red hat, quick talker. He creased the paper with his finger. He brought you here once, in May, pointed, out to, you, pointed to you out of the window convinced me to hand over two fresh-baked rolls, told me you were like to die from hunger if I didn't help you. He smiled at the memory. I'm sorry, sir, I said. I didn't mean to take your food. He pulled off a length of twine. Oh, you didn't. One of the advantages of courting the baker's daughter is all the bread a man can eat. He had not yet commented on my looking at the books. I feared he might try and trip me up, get me to say something. I ought not, but saw no other option than to be polite. I hope your lady is well, sir, I said. He concentrated on tying the bow. <laughs> so do I. She fled with her father to a village in Pennsylvania, a place called Hatboro. They make hats there. Clever, don't you think? He tried to smile, but his eyes were downcast and melancholy. Perhaps it's safer there, I said. Hey, he said, finishing the bow, with plenty of young men, men eager to protect her. But that's a tale for another day. He kept the package in his hand, lost in thought. Master Lockton will settle his aunt's account at the end of the week, I said. Oh, yeah. He gave me the package and waited as I settled in my basket. I hear you're one of them who feeds the lads in the bridewell. A sizzling log in the hearth popped suddenly and I jumped. Oh, not me, sir. Begging pardon, but someone's mistaken. He crossed his arms over his chest and shook his head. That there mark on your face? Makes you hard to forget, lass. The heat from the hearth filled the room and made it hard to breathe. My eyes darted to the window and I fought the urge to run. It felt like all of New York was watching me. He leaned forward and put his elbow on the counter, lowered his voice though it were, as though I were the only person in the shop. You tell them boys in the jail to hang on. There's plenty of us out here trying to help. Sir? He removed a slim volume from the counter. This is for you. Don't let your mistress see it.
I can't read, sir. He snorted at that one, quickly wrapped the book. Of course he can't. He pushed the package to my side of the counter. All who love liberty should commit to the words of the heart. I can't take it. I can't pay. I only have a few left and those I should burn. Read it, pass it on, and keep feeding the lads. I bobbed once and hid the parcel in my pocket under my apron, and as soon as I could stand close enough to a fire, I'd get rid of it. The last thing I needed was more trouble on account of independence. Yes, sir, I said, hurrying from the door. Thank you, sir. He raised his fingers to his lips in a last warning. Chapter 37 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Saturday, December 14th to Monday, December 23rd, 1776. Lady Seymour regained her strength by the day. I was no longer allowed to spend warm hours in her bedchamber. She took her breakfast and dinner alone, but joined the rest of the company for supper each night. Madame was saddened by her husband's aunt's return to health. The next week passed as in the kitchen storm of flour and sugar, for Christmas was fast approaching. Madame's list of required delicacies was endless. Gingerbread, pies of brandy peaches, preserved cherries and minced meat, macaroons, black manged, Jordan almonds, sugar candy, and as many kinds of cakes as there were fingers on both hands. I was the dog's body in charge of keeping the oven stoked with wood and the ashes cleared out, fetching forgotten ingredients from the market and beating eggs ten at a time, till my arm was near ready to fall off. Two of the soldier wives got into a terrible squabble the day of the woodpile froze. Hannah told Mary it was her turn to fetch home the buckets from the tea water pump. Mary said, no, it was Hannah's turn. Back and forth they went, the words getting hotter as the tempers grew shorter. I went yesterday, Mary said loudly as she poured boiling water over to the basin. You know that for a fact because you told me my nose was the color of a cherry when I came in. Hannah shook her head and scrubbed the floor. No, 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 that was two days ago. Yesterday, I slipped on the ice and fell on my backside. I near broke my tailbone. I did. Could barely come up the stairs this morning. You're a lying cod face, you are, Mary said. Hannah threw the brush of the bucket and water splashed on the floor. Who are you calling a liar? Hannah threw the brush in the bucket and water splashed on the floor. Sarah, the boss lady, came through the door just as Mary rounded the table. Her hands balled into fists. Sarah was getting close to her time and had, bit of, had a bit of temper herself. She slammed the door so hard the house full shook. Shut your gobs, she shouted. I'll report the pair of you to the colonel if you don't straighten up. There'll be no more brawling or caterwauling in this kitchen. But, they both said. Sarah leveled such a glare at the pair of them, I thought the hair would catch, their hair would catch fire, and I suddenly saw a way clear to my own purposes. Uh, begging your pardon, Miss Sarah, ma'am, I said meekly. What do you want, she said, her eyes still on the other woman. I can fetch the tea water, I volunteered. Mary shook her head back and forth. Oh, no, she won't. She'll tarry at the shops. She'll get out on her own chores. Make one of the men do it, I said. I'm the first one awake to build up fires, I explained. The shops are still closed then. I'll just dash up to the pump and be back before the sun comes up. Sarah gave me a suspicious look. Why would you take on extra work, special with it being so cold and dark in the morning? I was raised in the country, miss. Too much time inside makes me feel poorly. I like walking in the fresh air, even when it's cold. Twas mostly a lie, but the tea water pump was right close to the prison, and fetching water would give me a chance to check on Curzon every day. Hannah picked up her scrub brush, knelt to the floor again. Let her go, I say. Saves us trouble of freezing our tails off. She dipped the brush in the bucket. Don't know what possessed me to follow my Jimmy to this God-forsaken colony. The next morning found me headed up island before the, ro the sun rose. When I knocked on the guard horse do guard house door before the of the prison, it was opened by a soldier I had never seen before. A short man with black hair, sky blue eyes, and a scowl. You can't come in, he said after I explained my errand. Regulations been banned. Tell her about the windows, called another soldier, warming himself by the fire. The regulations permit civilians to deliver food and sundry provisions, but not firewood added the man in the hearth, yawning. But not firewood, re re repeated the first man. There will be regular patrols around the perimeter of the building to ensure the civilians do not tarry overlong in conversations with the prisoners. We'll be checking on the grub you've been giving them too, his companion said. Guards will inspect all civilian donations, the first man said formally. If you deliver contraband items, you will be imprisoned yourself. I shivered again. Are scones and jam contraband? 
Not yet. Back outside, I walked around the front of the building trying to figure out where Curzon's cell lay. Some prisoners were already awake, their hands and arms wrapped in rags sticking through the bars of the window. Curzon's cell lay at the back of the building. I rounded the corner and stopped. This was where the burial pits were dug. The pits were just a little smaller than the cells. Dug down the height of a grown man, one of them had already been filled with bodies and covered again with the dark mud. Two lay open and empty, sprinkled with snow like sugar on a cake. I didn't know how many bodies could fit in each one. I shivered again and pulled my cloak tight, then turned my back to the graves and counted the windows. Two, three, four, until I came to the window I hoped that led to Curzon's cell. The eastern sky had brightened enough for me to see all around, but the inside of the prison was dark. I stepped up to the building and the bottom of the window was just above the top of my head. I stood on tiptoe and stretched my hands up to the bars. Hello, I called in a hushed voice. Curzon? Anyone? The nasty fellow who had tried to steal my bucket on the first visit, Dibbon, leaned his face against the bars. He had a blanket around his shoulders and Curzon's hat upon his head. Won't let you in no more, eh? They changed the rules. Can you fetch my brother, please, sir? He's sleeping. I wanted to pull the bars apart, snatch the hat from his head, and thrash him with my fists and shoes. But that was impossible. I forced honey in my voice in a humble tone. Well then, may I please speak to your sergeant? Sarge is dead. He turned his head and spat. I'm in charge now. I'll take the victuals you brought. I started to reach into the bucket to hand the scones through the bars, but stopped. How do I know my brother's not dead too? Wake him up, please. Dibden opened his mouth but closed it without a word. His hunger was stronger than his temper, it seemed. He turned to someone in the cell. Get the black boy over here. A moment later, Curzon appeared at the window. He was shaking so badly he could barely stand. His half eyes closed his eyes half closed, teeth chattering. He had no blanket around him and there was puke stains on the front of his shirt. His gold earring was missing too. Curzon, Curzon, what ails you? What can I do? He didn't hear me or could not. He was insensible of his own name and where he was. Dipped and joined Curzon at the window. Terrible, ain't it? How fevers and pox tear through this place. There was a hollow lofter in the cell. Give his hat back and a blanket. He's getting his rations. Is he getting his rations? He did not answer me. That was an answer in itself. The prison was not a place of shared hardship anymore. It was a hole of desperation. You bloody beast, I swore. How dare you let him starve? The words flew out of my mouth without pause. Who are you reprimanding me, girl? Who are you to reprimand me, girl? He snarled, pulling his face up to the bars. He bre his breath stank of rotten teeth and snot pulled at the edge of his nostrils. He's a slave. He will not be treated the same as free men. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand. But you can remedy that, he said, with ease. I tried to keep my voice steady. How so? Curzon was seized by a fit of coughing so violent I feared his ribs would crack. He choked on his spittle and fought for breath, then finally relaxed back into his stupor, leaning against the window. Dibden glanced back at the other men in the cell before continuing. Our Captain Morse is on parole, lodged at the Golden Hill Tavern, we hear. Go there, tell him the men have fever and pox. One of our lads, Brig Brigadine, has a father in Piscuay with money and influence. If the captain can get word to him, Brigadine's father could arrange for a proper physician to attend us here. Curzon coughed again and moaned. Sweat glistened on his forehead. And the doctor would see my brother, I said and he gets a blanket and food. Dibden said something to the man and I couldn't see. A blanket appeared on Curzon's shoulder. Curzon clutched it around himself. And his hat, my voice was ice. Dibden removed the hat and placed it on Curzon's head. Lay him down, he instructed, on the, on the rushes, not the bare floor. Someone helped Curzon away from the window. I had no choice. I handed the jam-covered burnt scones up the window. Dibden stuck the first one in his mouth and passed the others to the men who were suddenly crowding the window. If he dies, you'll never see me again, I warned. Understood, he said. I found Captain Morse carrying out rubbish for the tavern keeper. He was a well-fed man wearing the brown coat trimmed with white that signified he was a prisoner of war. There was a big gap between his front teeth, but they looked clean enough. He joined me in the shadows of the alley and listened as I quickly explained my mission. I'll try to get word on Brigamain's family tonight. It's against the law for war prisoners to treat... To, it's against the law as the laws of war to treat prisoners so badly. He paced angrily. How often can you stop there? Every morning, sir. Good. Tell Dibden I'll get him what I can to ease their suffering, though I fear it will not be enough. My brother is among the prisoners. He's ill. Can you? 
Can I see that he's given his share of whatever Brigham Young provides? I surely will. Your brother was calm and brave during his final battles. He is a true soldier. The crow of a rooster interrupted him. The sun was fighting through the linen cloud, linen clouds. I picked up the buckets. I have to hurry. He nodded. Thank you for your help. My apologies, but I do not know your name. I am called Sal. Do you carry a last name as well, Sal? I hesitated. According to Madam, my surname was Lockton, but it tasted foul in my mouth. I shook my head. He smiled. Just Sal, then. Good day to you, just Sal. Lucky for me, the overcast morn caused the other servants to sleep past their normal time. By the time Hannah and Mary staggered up from the cellar, I had the porridge bubbling and the tea steeping. I could eat... I could eat, not eat, or drink a thing, for my belly was tied up with fear. My thoughts chased round and round my bread pan. I could not visit the prison daily. I was sure to be caught and punished, but I had to visit the prison daily. Curzon's life depended on it. But someone would see me, and I was sure to remember that mark on my face, and word would get back to Madame. And she would tell Colonel Hawkins, and he would get someone to follow me, and Captain Morse would be flogged for passing on messengers to the prisoners and Curzon's cell would be all be hung and buried in the pit. When I thought what they might do to me, I ran to the necessary and had a good puking. But the next day, I made my way up there again, food with the, for the prisoners, water for the Locktons, and every once in a while a message to the ga gape-toothed man in the brown coat at the Golden Hill Tavern. A few nights later, there was a terrible hullabaloo between Madame and the Master when he announced that supper he was planning to trap at supper that he was planning to travel on the next ship to London. He would carry messages to Parliament, conduct his own business, and likely to return to New York by summer. Madame was not pleased. First she argued that he ought not to go, and then he argued yes, then she argued yes, he should go, but that he should take her with him. When he refused, she threw a goblet in the fireplace and carried on so loudly that the master and Colonel Hawkins finally called for the carriage and left for the tavern. Madame dosed herself with strong wine, and after that, she went to bed. That night, temperatures fell so far below freezing that the biggest fire could not keep away the chill. I moved my pallet as close to the hearth as I dared, and sat with all my clothes, my cloak, and my blanket wrapped around me. It was so cold I could not sleep. General Washington and his men were holed up in Morriston. Folks said that they were in desperate need of stockings and food. I could scarce credit how hungry men with frozen feet could win a war. They were fools to even try. I waited at the first clock chimed eleven times, then twelve, watching the firelight and trying not to ponder. When I got up to add wood to the fire, my feet wandered themselves up to the pantry. My hands pulled the loose board there. Under the board were some sheets of newsprint I had saved, the lead piece from the statue of King George, my seeds, and the book given to me by the stationer. I carried the book to my warm pallet and I quietly untied the twine and removed the paper wrappings. I opened the book. A fellow named Thomas Paine wrote this little book and he called it Common Sense. Mama always said that common sense was far from common. That's why it was so special when you found it. The first sentence of the book did not seem to contain any. Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinctions between them. Whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. It took four readings to figure out what that actually meant, which I took to mean that life of folks is different than the world that rules over them. Payne sure did dance a long time with the notions before he said them. I closed the book and longed for Robinson Crusoe. Still stranded in the study where Colonel Hawkins was asleep, I dared not rescue him. I opened the book again and attacked, and attacked the next sentence. It's the end of the chapter. Chapter 38 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Tuesday, December 24th to Wednesday, December 25th, 19, no, not 19, 17, 76, sorry about that. I spent the day before Christmas hiding a holly bush with a pair of scissors. Madame required its twig and berries for her decorating schemes. My morning dash to the prison, pump, and tavern had gone wonderful and fast. There was no new messages to pass from Curzon's companions to Captain Morse, and the doctor secured by the rich Brigham family had delivered potions and bleedings to all. As promised, Curzon was spending most of his days sleeping, and he was not dead. It was Christmas Eve day. 
The holly bits were tied with pine branches and set on the sills of the street facing windows. Glass bowls of red berries were set on a small table in the drawing room, library, and the front parlor. Madame had two soldiers hang a ball of mistletoe in the front hall. This provided great merriment amongst the men and some blushing on the parts of their wives. I had never seen a house decorated with tree branches to celebrate the birth of the baby Jesus, but it did pretty up the place. The best was when Madame told us to hang dried rosemary throughout that cut right through the lingering stench of boots and belching. In keeping with tradition, I, I was to have Christmas Day free from work. I pondered hard on what I would do with so many hours for myself. Christmas at home had meant eating Mama's bread pudding with maple syrup and nutmeg, and reading the Gospel of Matthew out loud whilst Ruth played in Mama's lap. I was miles away from celebrating like that. I tried to bur bury that remembery, but it kept floating to the top of my mind like a cork in a stormy sea, and foolish tears spilled over. I finally decided to treat myself to a long stroll through all of New York, from the waterfront north to Chamber Street and side to side wander from the East River to the North River, which some had taken to calling the Hudson. From one day my legs would, could, would be my own, not to the beck and call of others. On Christmas morning Lady Seymour presented me with a new pair of black leather shoes that did not pinch any of my toes. Madame gave the soldier wives each a coin. She gave me nothing. When we returned home from the service at St. Paul's Chapel, Madame explained that my day off would begin as soon as I had finished serving the midday meal. Sarah had cooked it in advance, a sirloin of beef, smoked ham, onion pie, and plum pudding for dessert. Master and Madame both filled up the onion pie and hardly touched the fresh baked bread. Lady Seymour ate enough for an undersized mouse. I ate porridge and beef for my dinner, a right curious combination, but a tasty one. As I cleared away the table, Madame informed me that my day off would begin after I brought in wood and washed up the dishes. Lady Seymour fired off a cannon blast of a glare at her. But Madame pretended not to notice, and the master kept his face planted in his newspaper. There had been heat rising between the two women for days. Madame was prepared to row with the aunt of Charleston to get her rid of her. After the meal, the master went in order of the carriage to take them and some admirals out for eggnog. Lady Seymour said that she was going to rest and required nothing of me. As the lady limped to her chamber and the master disappeared down the stairs, I picked up the tray that held the last of the dishes. Madame poured herself another cup of tea. One moment, girl, she said. I paused. Yes, ma'am. Madame said nothing while she stirred the sugar into her tea. She sipped, wrinkled her nose, added another spoonful, and then sipped again. She set the teacup in the saucer and examined the walnut tarts on the plate before her. I stood like a statue holding the tray. Would she take away the rest of my day? Would she force me to wash the table linens or starch the master's shirts? Madame gave the tea another stir. You've been idling around Bridewell Prison. My heart stopped. She picked up a tart and considered it a scorched button bottom and returned to the plate. My husband Anne said that you visit the prison at her direction, bringing table scraps not good enough for pigs. She declared that forgiving and caring of the enemy is doing Lord's work. My heart started up again, racing so fast I thought it might escape my body. Madame picked up a second tart and scratched off the scorched bits with her knife before taking a bite. She chewed, sipped more tea, and swallowed. My husband's aunt is a blithering idiot who has completely lost her wits. You should have told me of her request at once. She finally looked at me, her eyes cold as frozen coins. You represent this house, girl. Your visits put us under suspicion, and having rebel tendencies, I will not be ruined by you. It would, even through innocence, as Aunt proclaims, or insolence, which I am suspecting, I forbid you to go to that prison. My arms shook from the weight of the tray, as well as her words. She could do anything. She could order me to the stocks, another branding, a public whipping of hundred slashes. She could beat me herself. She could tell me she had done she could tell, sell Ruth, me as she had done with Ruth, only place me in the cruelest master who'd work me to death in days. A pearl of sweat trickled down my cheek. Madame finished the tart and wiped the corner of her mouth with her fingertip. While my husband's aunt lives here, my hands are tied. She reached for another tart, but she'll be soon gone, one way or another, and Eliu will be in England. She popped the entire tart into her mouth, chewed, and then licked her fingers. That is the day you should fear girl. After the carriage left and dishes were washed, 
and Lady Seymour was sound asleep, I started my free day, still trembling from Madame's threat. How could I get word to Curzon that I couldn't bring him food any longer? Would Didden let him starve if I stopped bringing him messages? What if I ignored Madame's rules and then still continued to visit the prison? I walked block after block pondering. I walked past the rope works and the brewery to the orchard on the east side, silent under the snow. I walked past houses that had letters G.R. George Rex carved into the front door, property stolen in the name of the king. Like Madame had carved her letters into my soul, burned the mark into my skin. She can do anything. I can do nothing. The ashes of sadness and the buzzing bees from my melancholy had spun up a storm inside me. I walked and I walked until my new shoes rubbed blisters all over my feet and the blisters popped. I took the shoes off and I walked in the snow. Once my feet were frozen off, the blisters didn't hurt. As the sun ran for the west, rowdy songs started up in the taverns and groggeries. I found myself on the shore of the North River just above the battery. Empty rowboats were tied to the wharf. As the tide pulled out the ocean, they bobbed and bump bumped against each other. A few lights twinkled across the water in faraway New Jersey. I thought of all the ancestors walking the water's edge for their stolen children to come home, waiting and waiting and waiting. A thought surfaced through my ashes. She can't chain my soul. She could hurt me. She'd already done that. But what was one more beating? A flogging even. I would bleed or not. I would scar or not. I would live or not. But she could no longer harm Ruth and she could not hurt my soul, not unless I gave it to her. This was a new notion for me, a curious one. A group of soldiers singing loud as they swayed down the street, very muddy in drink. I hid in the shadows until they were gone, and then I headed back to Wall Street. I passed several houses filled with Christmas carols, joy to the world, and I saw three ships and the first Noel. A fat candle glowed in a parlor window of a house on a corner set there by someone home. The Locktons and Lady Seymour were all retired for the night by the time I returned. The house was still empty of soldiers and their wives. I built up the fire in the hearth. I set my shoes and damp stockings to dry in front of it. I rubbed, my cal I rubbed a calendula salve on my blisters. Christmas, Mama's voice reminding me, keep Christmas. For a second time on the very same day, tears threatened. I rubbed them away and I vowed not to cry again. It was a nuisance. I found myself studying the loaf of bread on the table, a sharp knife, showed up in my hand and the loaf was soon cut into fat slices. A chipped crockery bowl appeared from the pantry along with butter and eggs and milk and sugar and, and the nutmeg grater and the small amber flask. I baked me a maple syrup bread pudding in the Rhode Island style. While it cooked, I cleaned myself up good and proper. I thought about stealing a piece of Madame's rose scented soap, but that would have made me smell like her and I preferred to smell strong like lye. I washed my arms and legs and the back of my neck and my ears and my face and I dried myself with a soft clean rag. I frowned as I stepped back into my clothes. I'd grown some, they didn't fit proper. I'd let out the seams of the bodice as much as I could take in, and taken out the hem of the skirt, much more growing and I'd, I'd, I'd look a right scandal. But I couldn't think of that now. I was trying to make Christmas. I pulled on my dry stockings and I stepped into my new shoes even though they rubbed fierce on the popped blisters. I put the bowl of bread pudding in a basket, tied on my cloak, wound up my hands in rags and from, to keep the frost from biting. I walked out the back door. It was not yet midnight, so in truth it was still the day I could call my own. I set my path westward through the burned over district of Cavanstone. The line where September's fire had stopped was sharp. First a house with no damage, next a house still bearing black streaks of soot and smoke. Then a field of ruin with makeshift, makeshift hovels crafted from tent, brick and scorched timbers. Rats nibbled on frozen garbage heaps. The smell of the fire still lingered, tainted with the smell of filth and decay. But in the bleakness, there were spots of hope. A wreath was stuck on the front door of a tent. Children's clothes hung from a clothesline stiff with ice, but still sweet looking. A butter churn stood, wa stood watch over a neat stack of fresh split wood. Smoke swirled through from the top of a chimney, dipped at the roof line, then rose up to the stars. I lifted my face to the sky, and for the first time in much too long, I prayed. I prayed as hard as I could, without words or shapes or fancy talking. I just prayed. And when I was done, I felt cleaner than I had in my own bath. 
I walked on until I found a hut built along the lone brick wall, and from inside came a sound of a family, the papa's low rumble, the mama's bright laugh, the giggling children who had been allowed to stay up much too late and who did not want to fall asleep. I greeted them through the piece of canvas that served at their front door. The hovel fell silent, then the canvas was pushed away and the father stepped out, a musket in his hand. His wife came right behind him, though he told her to stay inside. It took some convincing to explain my mission, but I spoke polite and firm and held out the bread pudding, and the children snuck out into their nightclothes and just about dove into the bowl. The mother took the basket and said, thank you, and then thank you again, and then thank you most kindly, and then they went back inside. I hummed a carol as I walked away, finally feeling at peace. It's the end of the chapter. Chapter 39 from Chains by Laura B. House Anderson. Thursday, December 26th to Tuesday, December 31st, 1776. Two days later, Sarah had me go with her to the fish market. Her back was hurting her fierce and I was to carry the cod and halibut needed for the fish chowder. The market was crowded with folk whose cupboards had been cleaned out by Christmas feasting. And Sarah muttered rude things. Her growing discomfort had put her in constant temper. The cod was easy enough to purchase, but stall after stall turned up no halibut. Sarah insisted that haddock or catfish would not do, so we marched on. The air was thick with the cries of the stall owners promising the juiciest fish, the freshest fish, and the fish fit for the king himself. Before dawn, I had made the trip to the tea water pump, but I had not dared to visit the prison or Captain Moore's tavern. I was still confuddled about what to do. My thoughts wandered. I did not realize that Sarah had moved ahead of me in the crowd until a great shout went up. An oyster seller's cart had overturned in front of the carp stall and the two men were hollering at each other. The crowd halted and I had no place to turn. Sarah's white cloth cap bobbed away in the distance as I looked for a path out of the crowd, but bodies pushed in from all sides to watch the two men arguing. When a hand grabbed my arm, I gasped. Apologies, just so, Captain Morse said as he released me. His eyes were tired, but his cheeks were flushed. My mouth gaped open like a fish breathing its last. I shook my head. He couldn't talk to me in the view of all. There was no mistake in what he was. He was dressed in that brown and white coat. I turned first one way and then the other, but the bodies were packed around me so tight as could be. Morse kept his eyes on the arguing men, but leaned in face close enough to mine, and I could hear him whisper, we must. Sarah I had realized I was no longer with her. Her cap stopped, then slowly started back towards us. Her husband was a British gunner. If she saw talk, me talking to a rebel officer, go away, I muttered. I have news from my men. The oyster selling picked up the carp and took it and shook it in the other man's face, and the crowd laughed. Sarah plowed towards me. I beg you, Morse whispered, please. Soldiers appeared on the edge of the crowd or restored order. Come up to the tavern. Yes, yes, I told the captain. I'll come this afternoon. Now go away. The crowd melted under his eyes of the armed soldiers. The carp seller was explaining the ruckus to a sergeant while the oyster seller reloaded his cart. Sarah kicked oysters out of her way as she approached. Where in the name of all holy did you go? She asked. I was trapped in the crowd. I said I called you, but you couldn't hear me. She grunted and handed me a small fish with glassy eyes. This will have to do. Halibut, halibut is rare as hen's ten teeth today. I settled it on the basket atop the fat cod and followed Sarah as she headed from the market. We walked in silence for a few blocks, her concentrating on her huffing and puffing, me trying to figure out how I dared go to the tavern. The sky promised more snow. How long would Dibden wait before reclaiming Curzon's hat and blanket? We crossed the street. Miss Sarah, ma'am, I asked, as sweet as honey. What is it? I chose my words with care. Has Madame Lockton said anything about me in your hearing? She tilted her head a bit as she looked at me. Hey, this morning, matter of fact, she said that you aren't allowed to go to that blasted water pump. Said I should send one of the other girls, even though the sun is not up at the time of day, even though the streets would be covered in ice. Sarah reached for my elbow as we throw out upon a slick path of cobblestone. But I like getting out, I said. I don't really mind that chore. We, re we reached a stretch where ashes had been thrown onto the ice and the growing was safer. I don't answer to her, Sarah said as she released my man. My arm, I answer to the king's army. I'd be right pleased if you could keep fetching the water. Make sure it makes my life easier. 
She stopped and put her hands on her back, breathing heavily. Her baby belly was so big, she could have loaded it with a wheelbarrow and pushed it in front of her. She caught me studying her and gave me a quick smile. The baby will come soon, she said. It'll be a joyous day, I said. I'll keep getting the water, but, but what? Could you please not tell, madam? Sarah stretched to one side and winced. What she don't know won't hurt her. It's not like she's up at that hour anyway. After the midday meal, I contrived to overturn the pitcher that had held the water tea, dumping it onto the floor. Clumsy dolt! Hannah scolded as I, I knelt to clean up the floor with rags. Don't be looking at me to trudge up there and get more for her high mightiness, Mary said from the chair by the window. She squinted and, so, and sewed another stitch. I gotta hand these bridges for the light fades. I'll run up and fetch it, I said. Double time, I promise. Sarah gave me a good hard stare, sensing that she did not have the entire picture before her. It's your neck, she said. Mind she don't see you leaving. I near ran up the Golden Hill Tavern, my raw blisters hurting with each step. Captain Morse was idling on the porch, smoking a pipe. He disappeared inside when he saw me, and he was waiting in the alley when I reached it. Here, he handed me a loaf of bread. You, make, you made me come up here for this, I asked. Take it to Dibden. There's a note baked inside. A note? It contains wondrous news. Washington has beaten them. Sir? He clenched his fists and unclenched them. On Christmas night, the general led a surprise attack on Trenton. He beat the Hessians, killed a handful, and took more than 900 prisoners. Are you sure? I thought someone told him a falsehood. The British officers I knew were confident the American army was falling apart. Positively, he said with a grin. But won't that make the British mad? I asked. I truly hope so. I hope the king is so upset he jumps up and down on his crown. This war's not over, not by a long shot. I handed the bread back. I'll tell them the news, but I can't pass the note. That could land me in jail. He shoved the loaf back at me. You are a serving girl, delivering a tavern loaf to the starving prisoners. You don't know about the note. But why is it necessary? The men need to see my signature to know that it's true. They have endured so much, Sal. Don't deprive them of the chance to celebrate. This will strengthen their spirits. I pulled up the hood of my cloak to hide my face as I approached the prison. The commons was filled with drilling soldiers much more than usual. Their officers barked commands with urgency. The men marched grim-faced, swords flapping against their legs, rifle bouncing on their shoulder. Perhaps the captain's news was indeed the truth. I hurried b behind the building to the right window. I stood on tiptoe and squished the loaf through the bar bars. Dibden's face appeared at the window. There's a note inside, I whispered. Tear into it carefully. I ran away before I could, he could answer, willing my feet to move faster. I had to walk blo a block south when an enormous roar erupted from the prison. Hundreds of throats cheering, hooting, hollering, hundreds of hands clapping, feet stomping with joy. The noise was such that folks stopped what they were doing and ran out their doors to stare. The news spread from the prison as fast as it spread from cell to cell. The rebels had attacked instead of running. The rebels had advanced instead of retreating. The rebels had won the battle. Folks could scarce credit it. The end of the day. Chapter 40 from Chains by Lori House Anderson. Wednesday, January 1st to Tuesday, January 7th, 1777. Just after the new year came, word of another stalking victory for the rebels, this one at Princeton in New Jersey. Washington's troops chased the British from the battlefield, killed a passel of them, and took a hundred prisoners. Folks could scarce credit this neither. Colonel Hawkins let out a roar in the study when the news was delivered and hit the unfortunate messenger on the head with a rolled up map. Then he called for his horse and galloped off to headquarters. Within a day, the British promised boiled peas and rice with butter twice a week for their American prisoners, but they still did not allow fires in the Bridewell cells. The men had to eat their meat raw. Their chamber pots froze solid at night. The master's trip to London was moved up so that he could deliver news of the setbacks to Parliament and King, to the Parliament and King. Madame had finally accommodated herself to the notion of his voyage and had found a way to turn it to her advantage. Whilst we prepared Lockton's clothes for the journey, she wrote a long list of items she wanted to buy in England. I kept up the kitchen and cellar and woodpile when she was awake, but made my trips up island each day before dawn, looking over my shoulder at every sound, choosing a different path daily. The constant worry at every ate a hole in my belly. 
Curzon was stronger and told me not to fret, for he was not coughing up blood and his bowels were finally in working order. But he always asked me to come back on the morrow. The day of the master's departure, I roused myself extra early on account that I feared Madame might do the same. I deposited stale rolls and burnt hun hunks of pork on the window sill of Curzon's cell, then crossed the commons on my way to the pump. There was a few folk on the way to the early morning errands, all bundled up in cloaks and blanket clothes and shawls and scarves wrapped high. You there, a voice called out. Everyone stopped to look. You there, girl. Oh no. A British soldier hurried towards me. I relaxed some when I saw his face. It was the mountain-sized guard who had let me visit Curzon's cell when he was first imprisoned, the one who liked to eat. Haven't seen you around, he said he neared me. Rules don't allow civilians in the cells, I bobbed quickly. He lowered his rifle to the ground and eyed my bucket. To your knife, what'd you bring me today? Bread crusts and burnt meat, sir. He wrinkled his nose. What about yesterday? Yesterday was kidney pie and stale almond cake, sir. He shook his head and licked his lips. Hmm, sorry I missed that. I am. Wouldn't it hurt to drop a bite now and then to one such as myself, would it? No, sir, I answered. I shall remember that. He tilted his head to the side. Your master ever hire you out? Tis common in, those, common in those days for folks to hire out their slave to make money. The slaves did not see the money, of course. But if I had a chance to work away from the prying eyes of madam, I would be grateful for it. Ah, uh, sure. Yes, sir, I lied. We need a maid to clean out the cells. Dying men do puke out something terrible, they do. You're a steadfast girl. Tell your mistress we'll pay her the going rate for her services. I shall tell her, sir. He, sh he shouldered his rifle. I'm on the night watch now. Father, the name is Fisher. Bring me round some cake. I'll keep an eye on your brother. Thank you, Mr. Fisher, sir. I shall. No kidney pie, though. Kidney sour, my gut, some something terrible. The master left for London with much muttering on the part of his wife. She did not take to her bed as I expected, was, but was driven round to the home of Mrs. Taylor to play cards and no doubt complain about her husband. While she was gone, Sarah birthed her baby boy in the cellar. I was sore tempted to sneak down the stairs and watch. I'd seen kittens and calves come into the world, but never a baby. I had a wonderful curiosity about it. I dared not. I kept boiling the water for the midwife and stuck cloths in my ears to keep out the noise. When Sarah stopped hollering, I crept down the stairs to see the babe. He was round-headed, fat fellow with a big eyes and bigger ears. George, Sarah called him. You named him after the king, Hannah asked. Perhaps, Sarah said cheerfully. We never figured the colonists would hold on this long. My man was saying the other night that maybe the king would stop the war. Maybe the babe made us stay here, not sail home. Plenty of room here, he said. She kissed the baby's nose. A name like George is a good one on either side of the ocean. Shh, warned Mary. The next day, Sarah and, George, and her George moved to a house set aside for new mothers attached to the army. I was really sad to see her go. I had wanted to hold the little one and make him laugh. Lady Seymour wanted to hear all the details about the new baby. I thought maybe I could visit Sarah and ask her to bring the little lad by. Something about a baby always bring old folks back to life. When I mentioned this notion to the lady, she just shook her head. Oh, not until this pestilence had left my lungs. Heaven knows when, when that will be. Her health was changeable and flighty. One day she would feel strong and lively, and she'd eat three meals and drink a gallon of tea, and the next day she would lie in bed forever with fever. Looking so poorly, it tempted Madame to order the coffin made. I went to place another log on, on her fire. Lady Seymour was lying propped up on the pillow in her bed, and she shook her head. No more wood. I'm warm enough. Please sit down, Isabel. Ma'am? I would like you to sit down, either in the chair or on the edge of the bed. I would, I should like to talk to you. It was improper for a servant to sit with a lady as though they were companions, but she asked me direct, so I sat myself in the chair and I was close to the fire. I could not figure what she wanted to conversate on. She hadn't sent for, for a newspaper or sweets in days and days. Had I displeased her? Thank you. She sat back and used her right hand to place her left on her lap. I will soon meet my maker, Isabel. I am a sinner, sinner in need of forgiveness. I relaxed. Ah, twas the pool of death that made old people go funny. Miss Mary Finch went the same way towards the end. Cloudy war clouds would roll into her eyes and she would talk nonsense for hours. Me and Ruth just sat polite and listened. The trick with adult old folks was just to be agreeable. We will all seek forgiveness, Lady Seymour. I wanted to buy you, she said. I wasn't sure I'd heard that right. I beg your pardon, ma'am? 
I tried to buy you from Anne after I first met you. She refused and we argued like a pair of fishwives. I rather lost my temper, she chuckled. Had never done that for 30 years. I knew not what to say. She studied her useless hand. When I returned from exile, I should have demanded you be placed in my household. I was horrified by your treatment and of course your poor sister. And then the fire. I regret it. I didn't force the matter. You should have suited my household. It would have eased her mind if I thanked her for wanting to buy me away from Madame. I tried to be grateful, but I couldn't. A body does not like being bought and sold like a basket of eggs, even if the person who cracks the shells is kind. Isabel? She waited with some words from me. I didn't know how to explain myself. It was like talking to her maid, Angelica, who was so much like me, at the same time so different. We two had no string of words that could tie us together. Yes, ma'am, thank you for telling me this. And that was all I could muster. Forgive me, she said, I'm a clumsy old woman. There was a shout from the drawing room upstairs where Colonel Hawkins and his men had been meeting. I stood, the soldier wives are all visiting Sarah. I should go on, she said, closing her eyes. Colonel Hawkins was in the right foul mood on account of the forms that he had to fill out and reports that were late. The war seemed fought with as much paper as bullets with letters and passes and permissions piled high on the table. Orders received and recorded, recordings of conferences noted down. When I entered, he hollered that the room was colder than a barn and called me to, and, and called me all manners of rude names. I chose the wood for his fire very carefully, the greenest, dampest logs I could find in an entire woodpile, guaranteed to smolder and sputter without giving off any heat and even less light. And after a frigid hour, he left for his headquarters it took all my might not to crack a smile. The grandfather clock ticked off the minutes. Madam would not return home for a, god a goodly while. She was a terrible card player, but she had lo loads of money to lose. Her companions would keep her there for at the table as long as possible. I peeked in Lady Seymour's door and she was wrapped up in her coverlet and sleeping. The blankets barely moved when she, when she breathed, when she took a breath, sorry. I pulled out common sense from its hiding place and I read by the firelight. In truth, there were some pages that I jumped over as I found it too hard to figure out their meaning. But I gathered many of the thoughts. Americans had a good cause to overthrow their British masters. A person born to wealth was not born to rule over others, and twas good and proper to fight injustice. I kept the mending basket close in hand, just in case I needed to hide my crime. And that's the end of the chapter.